welcome all. Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Mara Dwyer. I, am, I participate in the Baltimore region of the Poor People's Campaign. And I am part of the Theomusicology and Arts Group, which we shorten as TMA. I'm a visual artist in Baltimore, and this will be my first song lead. So get ready to start singing. So we are going to open it up with a song because we are the TMA group. And I'm going to ask that everyone does mute themselves because we're on Zoom. Um, but I have my, uh, my settings on gallery view so I can still see everybody's face and I can still see that you're singing. This is going to be a little bit of a call and response. So this is a really special song called Rebel. And it was written by the Peace Poets and Code Pink for the Conference on the War Economy and Militarism by the Cairo Center and the New York State Poor People's Campaign in 2019. There is a call and response. So I'll say the first word, which is rebel, and you'll say rebel back. And then I'll say the second line, and you'll say that line back, and we'll keep going. So when I say a line, you'll say a line. And I'll be kind of watching and, like, and, and looking for folks to kind of feel our timing. Um, tonight, we are going to name the two decade wars in Iran and Iraq, along with the most recent brutal 11 day battle between Hamas and the Israeli military. If you think of other war torn areas around the world where injustices have been swept under the rug, please name them, lift them up in the chat and we will lift them up in our song. Okay, I've got my screen on gallery view. Are we ready? Okay, I see folks, I see hands, 11 hands. All right, thank you so much for Pauline for teaching me this song last week. So the first line goes, rebel, and then you go, rebel. Okay, I saw some, some singing. Against the war they sell, against the war they sell, rebel. Against the lies they tell, against the lies they tell, rebel, rebel. And let us do this right, and let us do this right. Rebel for all the children in the world tonight. Rebel for all the children in the world tonight. You want to try that again? We'll do that one more time and then we'll go into the other lines. Okay. Rebel, rebel. Against the war they sell. Against the war they sell. Rebel, rebel against the lies they tell, against the lies they tell. Rebel, rebel, and let us do this right, and let us do this right. Rebel for all the children in the world tonight. Rebel for all the children in the world tonight. All right, now we're going to get into the second. First, how did that go? Thumbs up if you're with me. All right, I see some thumbs up. Thank you all. So it's the same, same tune, but we're gonna change the words a little bit. Rebel, rebel. Rebel for all the children in Iran tonight. Rebel for all the children in Iran tonight. Rebel, rebel, rebel for all the children in Iraq tonight. Rebel for all the children in Iraq tonight. Re rebel, rebel, rebel for all the people across our regions tonight. Rebel for all the people across our regions tonight. Rebel for all the people in Maryland and the world tonight. Rebel for all the people in Maryland. I don't have this one in the world tonight. And I see somebody put in the chat. Rebel for all the people in Nicaragua tonight. Anybody else have somebody they want to uplift in the chat? If not, that's okay. 
Honduras, yes. Let's do that one. Rebel for all the people in Honduras tonight. Rebel for all the people in Venezuela tonight. Haiti. Rebel for all the people in Haiti tonight. Colombia. Rebel for all the people in Colombia tonight. And Cuba, yes. Rebel for all the people in Cuba tonight. Thank you. And Afghanistan. Thank you, Phyllis. All right. Thank you for lifting those countries up, the people in those countries that are suffering under the war economy and militarism. And thank you for singing along with me tonight. Thank you so much. So my name is Pauline. I use the pronoun she, her, hers. Uh, I'm, new, I'm new to Maryland, so I'm, I'm new to Piscataway territory here. Um, and we're really excited to have this session tonight. I wanted to lift up some words by uh, Dr. Reverend Barber from the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for more revival of an article that came out in um, 2020. And he said in this article, uh, and I'll, I'll drop the article in the chat, perhaps most of all, we've been critical of the bloated military spending, 738 billion this year. So that was in 2020 that distorts our nation's priorities. While 53 cents of every discretionary tax dollar goes to the Pentagon, we're told that there's no money to pay for Medicare for all, a Green New Deal, ending college debt, or a new jobs program. The military has long been the biggest, best funded institution in our entire government. And right now, while we're struggling against a deadly pandemic, we're not using it for anything close to the right reasons. And so I thought that would be a really great way to ground us tonight in thinking about Maryland um, and thinking about uh, the monies that we spend. There, there's some figures, you can go to national uh, fact sheets. Uh, we have fact sheets about the war economy. Um, and the US wars in Iraq and Afghanistan have cost $6.4 trillion. And this, this stat kind of uh, shook, shook me a little bit. Um, it would take a full-time minimum wage worker more than 7 million lifetimes to earn that much money. That's how much money we spend on the military. And we're spending it on detention, deportation, and border patrol. Uh, spending in 2018 was $21 billion, more than six times as much as federal homeless assistance programs. This is very much the war on the poor. And so tonight... We are here to, to talk about American exceptionalism and the global consequences of the five injustices. And the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for more revival, those five injustices are, if you know them, feel free to drop them in the chat. But they are ecological devastation, systemic racism, the war economy, poverty, and this distorted moral narrative of religious nationalism. I'm reminded about Dr. King's speech at Riverside Church in 1967, where he said that there was a cruel manipulation of the poor and it was driven by profit margins maintained by racism and would require a revolution of values that could fundamentally reorder the political and economic priorities that made the United States the greatest purveyor of violence in the world. And today, a bunch of us took action in, in Washington, D.C. Thinking about this revolution of, revolution of values and thinking about how we are a new unsettling force in this nation's complacent life. That's something else that Dr. King called us, called the poor and dispossessed, the 140 million living in the United States of America. So I would like to introduce the two speakers that we are going to hear from next. Our first speaker, Phyllis Bennis, has worked for justice and cross-border solidarity for nearly 50 years by means of both professional in-depth analysis and grassroots action. She has partnered closely with organizations ranging from the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for more revival to the United Nations to develop progressive peace-oriented policies that provide clear alternatives to militarism and to growing inequity. She is a fellow at the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington, DC, 
where she directs the new internationalism project. Venice will be followed by Greg Wilson. Greg is a passionate advocate for environmental justice with the Sunrise Movement in Baltimore. He brings his experience as a US military veteran to his critical work in curbing the Pentagon's disproportionate impacts on our planet and our communities. Thank you so much. And thank you all for being here tonight. It's, it's been a wonderful day, starting with several hours at the Supreme Court steps in the protests on this 100 and I think it's the 148th anniversary of the Seneca Falls Women's Conference, fighting for women's rights to vote. Uh, and now being here with all of you from the Poor People's Campaign and for Peace Action of Maryland. Uh, it's a privilege, so thank you for that. I'm, I'm delighted to, to join you tonight. You know, these last few days and, and today, um, we've had a bunch of anniversaries. July 4th, of course, the anniversary of the Declaration of Independence in this country, a revolution of a sort. July 14th, the storming of the Bastille prison in, in France at the height of the French Revolution. And of course, today is the anniversary of the Nicaraguan Revolution, the Sandinista Revolution, which is going through a very rough, a very rough period right now. You know, I think all revolutionary movements think of themselves as exceptional, think of themselves as being different than those who have gone before, those on whose shoulders they in fact stood. Uh, history views them all very differently and people view that history differently. I think that every country, in every country, let's say, people, believe that they and their countries are exceptional, you know, that they are different than, than everyone, just as revolutions believe that as well. I think in fact, most countries are not really so exceptional. Most countries are like lots of other countries. They're, they're all different, they all face problems, but they're similar in the sense that they are products of, of human beings. And so they are inevitably going to be challenge, they are going to be hard, they're going to be difficult, they're going to face challenges that they can't quite figure out until perhaps the next generation comes along and helps the earlier generation to figure that out. So the, the challenges we see now in once revolutionary countries, revolutions that at various points in time many of us may have supported and now are in very troubled circumstances, whether Haiti, Cuba, Iraq, Nicaragua, Afghanistan, South Africa, Palestine, the list goes on and on. We're in a very troubled moment. This pandemic, of course, has made everything worse around the world. But there's a particular danger to US exceptionalism. I think a lot of people use the term American exceptionalism. I'm reluctant to, unless I have to use that term because it really leaves out most of the Americas, which is South America, Central America, Latin America. Uh, but US exceptionalism is I would say a particularly dangerous phenomenon because it combines the kind of arrogance that all supposedly exceptional nations and exceptional peoples believe themselves to have. They combine that notion of being the shining city on the, on the hill as Ronald Reagan described it with a level of power, economic and political and diplomatic and most of all military absolutely unprecedented in the history of the world. And when you combine those two things, that kind of powerful arrogance with the power of the strongest military capable of more death and destruction than any other military in history, you have a very dangerous, a very dangerous moment. I wanna talk about these five crucial injustices that the Poor People's Campaign has has framed their work around. So in, in looking at how these injustices come together, racism, poverty, militarism, the, the climate crisis, and religious nationalism, we have to look at them historically. So in this country, when we think about our history, I always think about the works of, of Howard Zinn, who I'm sure many of you know his, his extraordinary book, The People's History of the United States the first really popular history book that didn't start from the vantage point of presidents and, and generals and battles and kings, but started from the vantage point of ordinary people, of workers, of poor people, of enslaved people, of native people, 
people subject to genocide, people subject to all kinds of oppressions, and who fought back. And what's so critical, I think, about Howard's work, he taught us that the power of the United States, its economic power, its political power, its military power, its geographic power, all were rooted in this history of genocide and slavery genocide against the indigenous people that were here when the first white settlers came, and the enslavement of black Africans who were brought here to bring wealth out of the land. But he taught us something else that I think was crucial that we also, as movements, sometimes forget. And that is that from the origins of our country, we were also characterized by movements against slavery and genocide, right from the beginning. It doesn't mean they won all the time. They lost plenty of times. And sometimes they won. But it was that understanding, that dialectic between the reality of what gave this country power, how they stole power by killing people, destroying the land, making it unlivable for people and plants and animals and living things, by destroying the lives of people brought here in chains. That all of that exists. And it was also true from the beginning that those people suffering themselves and others who understood what it meant to make someone else suffer built movements to challenge that right from the beginning. So the link, that what, what the Poor People's Campaign speaks of as a fusion movement, what others of us these days talk about as intersectionality, has been with us from the beginning. So the, the notion of genocide against the indigenous population of this country clearly involved racism. These were people who were not white, so they were seen as a legitimate target. The environment and, cl and, the, and climate, this was a, a, a genocidal war that destroyed the climate, that destroyed the land, the waters, the animals on which human beings depended for their lives. It imposed poverty on an entire set of nations that already existed in this land. And in doing so, it relied for legitimacy on what was known as the doctrine of discovery that said that any non-Christian, non-Christian run country or land or territory where Christian white people landed, according to the Pope, they would have the right to steal that land simply on the basis of racism. And then finally, militarism. Militarism is what those settlers relied on to carry out that genocide. Slavery as an as a economic reality in this country was rooted, of course, in racism that imposed a level of poverty unseen in this country, was justified by the defense of the United States as a white Christian nation. So again, all of these intersectional evils were part of our early history. Dr. King taught us that war is the enemy of the poor. And clearly the era in which he was writing, the era of the war on poverty and the war against Vietnam, you saw that contradiction where the, the guns and butter debate was settled by Johnson when he chose butter. Uh, sorry, when he, chose, when he chose guns, I'm sorry. I said it exactly as it should have been, but was not. When he chose the guns over the butter. So that people in Vietnam and Laos and Cambodia and poor people across the United States, the young men who were forced by the draft into the military, the families that were left behind, everyone suffered because of those distractions, the, the diversion of funds, the diversion of political attention to a war across the world. And who did the war target? It targeted the poor of those countries, of Vietnam, of Laos, of Cambodia. And Dr. King said something else in that same time. He said that budgets are moral documents, or in the case of the United States, too often immoral documents. But the point was that budgets show our priorities. They show the world and they show ourselves what we believe to be important. So when we create a military budget every year that is calculated at something like $753 billion this year. The numbers look different in different places because some do and some don't include, for example, the $20 billion that's spent on nuclear weapons. Why? Because they're not 
under the purview of the of the Pentagon, they're officially under the purview of the Energy Department. So sometimes when you look, it looks smaller and you say, oh, what happened? Did they cut the budget? No, whoever you're looking at just didn't include all of it. But what we are seeing, what, what the Poor People's Campaign in particular has contributed to this fusion movement in identifying these intersectional injustices and what Peace Action has done so magnificently over so many years, going back to the days of sane freeze when it was focusing on nuclear weapons alone, was to recognize the global impact of these evils that shape the power of this country. All of these intersectional injustices have global impacts, but the question of climate and the question of militarism are the ones that are the most directly international. Militarism is central. This notion of budgets as showing our morality, our immorality, is a crucial function. When we spend 53 cents of every federal dollar on the military and only 12 to 15 cents, depending on which year you're looking at, on anti-poverty programs, you know that this is a thoroughly immoral government with, based on immoral assessments of what is legitimate. All of this is linked to the issues that we are taking up today, the, the challenge around voting rights and more. Today at, at the, in, the, in the steps of the Supreme Court, Reverend Barber spoke of how voter suppression exists to support the interests of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and the military industrial complex. He included that because that's crucial. Voting su voter suppression means excluding the votes of those most likely to vote for candidates who will oppose war. And that's a crucial question, not only of politics, but also of morality not least because we have to understand that the costs of war are not only those economic costs that are so desperately needed at home to pay for a Green New Deal, to pay for Medicare for All, to pay for a massive jobs program, to pay for green infrastructure, to pay for all the things that this country, the most wealthy country in the world, should be providing to our entire population. But it also does something else. It ensures that our military continues to kill people. And the reason we need to stop the wars, the reason we need to cut the military budget by starting with cutting it in half by $350 billion is because we have to bring that money home and we have to stop killing people. We cannot leave out either of the two reasons. Now, why is military spending so high? In the post-World War II period, when military contractors, military companies, military manufacturers were making a killing in every sense of the word throughout the war on producing the bombs and the planes and the weapons and the ships and all that goes with it. It was the one time that I sort of believed there was a conspiracy. I really don't like conspiracy theories. I think they're mostly kind of stupid. But there's one conspiracy that I've just never been able to figure out another explanation. And that is the answer to the question, how did the military producers, the military corporations, how have they stayed so wealthy after World War II, which was the, the period when such a massive amount of money was being spent on armaments? And the answer is that military production, unlike every other kind of production in this country, is routinely carried out in what's known as a horizontal method of production, which is the least efficient way to produce anything. The most efficient way to produce something is to do it all in one place, where you get the raw materials and you make whatever you need to make all in one place. Each step of the production process is right there. And at the end, you have a finished product. You load them back on the trains that brought the raw material and you send it out into the world. That's the efficient way. The way military goods are produced is the opposite. Everything that's produced, every widget that is attached to some other widget that's screwed into another widget is produced in one place, sent somewhere else to be attached to widget number two. The one two widget is then put back on trains and buses and planes and whatever and shipped somewhere else where widget number three is going to be produced as soon as the five different kinds of military production processes can be opened in 
this new place, you get my point. It's the least efficient way to produce anything. But it guarantees one very important thing. And that is that military production happens in virtually every congressional district in this country. So that every member of Congress has some level of jobs, whether it's 5,000 jobs at, in Seattle with Boeing, or whether it's 12 jobs at some little subcontractor somewhere that's making the, the nut and the bolt of one part of the, the tanks that are being put together in 15 other places around the country. And when that happens, no matter how anti-war some member of Congress might be in their own part of hearts, they are very, very, very rarely going to be willing to vote against a spending bill that includes those 12 jobs in their district because they will be threatened with being primaried out, right? So that's what we're dealing with. And that's the conspiracy that I can't quite figure out how did that happen other than the owners of all those military corporations getting together one day and saying, here's how we're going to do it, guys. Maybe that didn't happen. I don't know. But I can't quite figure out another way. And as a result, the military industrial complex is a very complex reality that we have to confront. So we have to look at this question of how to, to recognize the need for maintaining the jobs and protecting the people that hold those jobs. That's what the, the kinds of, of transitions, just transitions are so necessary while recognizing that the United States as a global power means that the impact of all that production is wars all around the rest of the world. The military is still the most important component here. And that's why I think the world writ large, those in power in the, in the media and in government in this country in particular, have never been willing to recognize Dr. King's Riverside speech of 1967 when he came out against the war in Vietnam for the first time publicly as his probably most important speech. It's because of the centrality of militarism in how US power continues. So I wanna say just two other things and then I'm gonna end so that we have time for discussion and such. One is about movements. One of the things that I think is so important for those of us who work in movements, in organizations, that are specifically focused on issues of war and ending war. We find that it's often very difficult to get that issue to be taken up by the broader movement. Not because anybody disagrees, everybody agrees with the war in Iraq was wrong, the war in Afghanistan was wrong, we need to bring home the troops. Those are not contentious issues. Those are widely agreed to issues. The harder part is figuring out for, for organizations that are working incredibly hard on crucially important issues, organizations like Sunrise and so many others that are working on climate justice. How do we get the issue of militarism into the agenda, the working agenda of all those movements? Some of the links are now being made. The Black Lives Matter movement, the movement for Black Lives has taken up the question of Palestine as a fundamental component of their work. That's been huge in broadening the issue of internationalism. The, the climate justice movement is inherently an internationalist movement because Mother Earth doesn't recognize borders. And we know how these things spread. We're seeing it now with the pandemic as well. But this is not an answer by itself. We have to be sure that all of our friends and comrades in other movements have day-to-day -day access, are familiar with how easy it is to work with, for example, the, the National Priorities Project that with three clicks can tell you for say the military spending in the year 2021, for the state of, of, of Maryland, how much tax money is coming from the state of Maryland to pay for the military budget this year? I did it in a second, right before we started today, $16.6 .6 billion. Now that's a lot of money, but it's also kind of amorphous. What does that mean? What's a billion dollars? Has anybody ever seen a billion anything? Most people haven't even seen a million anything. And this is a thousand million, right? It's really hard to picture what that means. So one more click and what do you get? You get the exact amount 
of trade-offs that would be possible if Maryland did not spend that $16.6 billion on killing people in Afghanistan and Iraq and Somalia and so many other places, what could they do with that money? Well, it turns out that they could find 380,587 15 hour an hour, $15 an hour job with benefits for a full year. They could put 450,741 children in Head Start for four years. They could provide 2.6 million adults with health care. Or they could retrofit 24.5 million houses with solar electricity. What makes us safer? So those links to other movements has to include our responsibility to provide that information. We've worked with people in the movement for a Green New Deal to get the one line in there that says that we need to cut the military budget to pay for a Green New Deal. It's not in it yet, but it will be at some point. I have every belief. And I think that those are the kinds of intersecting work that needs to be central to our own work. So finally, we have to be very clear that we can never keep our focus solely on what happens in the United States. The 140 million poor and low wealth people in this country are central in our organizing focus of the Poor People's Campaign and so many others in this country. And that's as it should be. Thank you. And it's also true that the rest of the world is hurting by the fact that $753 billion is being spent on the military this year. So we have to also look at what could that $16.6 .6 billion in Maryland be used for in terms of development aid and vaccines and clean water all around the world. We're coming up on the anniversary of September 11. We have to look at the lives that were lost, not only here on September 11, but the lives that were lost in the wars that followed. The 100,000 Afghans, the 800,000 Iraqis and more. That's what all the cost is about. It's what would have happened if all those people were still alive today. Thank you. Now we're going to hear from Greg. Hi, all. My name's Greg, uh, Greg Wilson, and I'm a U.S. military veteran. I was in Afghanistan. Uh, and I served from 2009 to 2013, uh, and I spent 2010 and 11 uh, in Afghanistan as a medic. Um, and a lot of people think that you wouldn't transition from that into working on climate change, but I'm an organizer now with the uh, Sunrise Movement. I'm one of the action team leads from Sunrise Movement Baltimore. So we promote the Green New Deal, working to fight climate change and climate injustice uh, and um, create a livable world uh, and millions of good jobs for Americans in the process. So when I was deployed, um, you know, Phyllis gave this very uh, a sort of comprehensive overview of the military industrial complex. I'm going <laughs> to tell you a much more personal story. Um, when I was deployed, uh, I lived right on the border to Pakistan at a base called Torkham for about six months. I spent six months at a, at a different base. And uh, at Torkham, it was a base that had been set up almost immediately at the beginning of the war on terror. Um, it was actually had, had existed, been built by the Afghan army back in the uh, 70s and 80s, and then been abandoned. And the CIA actually uh, sort of took possession of it prior to uh, US troops even officially moving into Afghanistan following the September 11th attack. So uh, late September, early October, Torkham had been occupied by uh, US forces. And I arrived there in 2010, so a full nine years afterwards. And, you know, flew in via helicopter is the only way to get there. Um, there's a highway, but the uh, likelihood of roadside bombs made that really untenable. So helicopters would ferry troops in and out of this place, maybe four at a time. Uh, about 200 troops lived there, so helicopters were flying in and out all day step off the helicopter and what I noticed was that our electrical power was being produced at that base by temporary portable generators. Not uncommon in the military. 
But I thought it was a little strange that temporary portable uh, diesel fuel generators had been being used in this place for, at that point, nine years. Okay, go to get settled in and uh, the fuel for all of these things is actually getting trucked in. It gets trucked in from uh, Pakistan. It gets unloaded on a port there, loaded into trucks and driven across the Afghan border all the way up. So you think about hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of fuel trucks. Um, probably we saw about 180 fuel trucks come through the checkpoint every day on their way to fuel all of the military uh, in Afghanistan. And of course those trucks, you think about 180 trucks, they burn a lot of fuel just by themselves, but they're full of uh, JP-8. It's like diesel fuel, but uh, it fuels tanks and helicopters and boats and trucks and generators and anything else. Um, so there was this huge amount of fuel coming in and it was being burned in these generators. And then uh, one of my jobs as a medic was uh, sanitation. So we checked on the, the water for the base and we checked on the trash and the waste and the food storage and all these things. Uh, and our waste disposal system for that uh, base was to take all the trash, load it in a dump truck, drive it up over the hill uh, and dump it into a pile. And it was a, a trash fire. And we didn't actually have to add any fuel or start a fire when we needed to throw our trash away because there was so much trash that had been in this pit for so long that it was actually permanently smoldering. So we would take everything that got disposed of on the base, um, biohazardous materials, expired medicines, unused ammunition, wasted food, styrofoam mattresses, uh, and all of it would be taken to the burn pit and uh and set on fire and you know we'd go jogging for exercise and soldiers would you know go up by the burn pit and uh we would we'd play a game where you would hold your breath the last fresh breath that you could get before you walk past the burn pit and then we would try to sprint all the way through the smoke coming from the uh, styrofoam trash fire to the other side before you had to uh, take another breath in uh, as you're exercising and running in the morning. And at night, when the air would get cool, the smoke from the trash fire would settle, you know, the, we're at high altitude already. So when the, when the air cools, the clouds really come down um, to about ground level and we would be swirled in the smoke from the trash fire all night in our bunks. We tried to get a trash incinerator that was supposed to be the next level of um, sort of safety and health equipment. My physician's assistant I was working with at the time was appalled that this was a condition um, for uh, for his perspective at the time he was appalled that the soldiers he was caring for were breathing in this smoke and uh you know he tried to get this trash incinerator he's doing all this paperwork he gets the battalion safety officer out there and he's talking about the smoke and this and that and finally he 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 gets approval and they order the trash incinerator and it's going to be seven million dollars and you know they they put it through ship ship the trash incinerator we're like cool we're waiting for it we got a spot for it when it gets here Truck comes from Jalalabad, forklift, picks it up, sets it down, big old crate. We go out there with a crowbar, bust it open. And they had only delivered half of the $7 million trash incinerator. My whole year in Afghanistan, we never actually received the second half of the $7 million trash incinerator. Spoke with a soldier later who had deployed to Torkham. Um, much more recently to now than I had. Of course, <laughs> in 2009, I thought it was absurd that Torquem had been running a temporary generator and burning its trash for nine years, but it's been another decade and Torquem is still, maybe not to this day, but a couple of months ago, uh, still running portable diesel generators, still burning their trash in a pit. I got out of the army. I went to get my degree on the GI Bill, and I uh, was studying some ecological issues, and I came across a statistic that the United States military is the single largest 
carbon emitting organization on the planet. And I said, that can't possibly be true. There's only about one and a quarter million people. You know, there's <laughs> there's about a third as many people in the entire U.S. military as work for Walmart. I said, you can't possibly think that this many people can't uh, can't possibly do that. But then I realized that every base in Afghanistan, every base in Iraq, every base in Jordan and all the other Middle Eastern countries in which we've, uh, you know, provided military support for, they're all set up on this temporary short term basis. And all of the decisions that were made were saying we're willing to give up the right thing to do because we believe that our combat mission is more expedient uh, than the health of the soldiers, the cost, the damage to the environment, or anything else. And I see that same uh, viewpoint when people are talking about climate change and what we can't do. We can't rebuild our infrastructure. We can't do this. We can't do that because we're focused on the short term. And I dream of a day in which we're able to take that viewpoint of this is something that needs to be completed at any cost and apply it to something that actually needs to be completed at any cost. If that was the attitude that we had towards solving climate change uh, instead of imperialism, then we'd be in a pretty good position by now. Um, and Phyllis mentioned that uh, I, I, two and a half trillion dollars uh, on Afghanistan alone for, for, for 20 years. Imagine if 20 years ago we had said we're going to spend three trillion dollars over the next two decades on fixing climate change. We could have said that in 2001. It wasn't new information in 2001. Um, so that irony, that hypocrisy was really what drove me personally into um, not only climate change work, but also the dismantling of the military industrial complex. Uh, and that's work that Sunrise Movement has been at least ten tangential to. Um, uh, we've spoken to representatives uh, in the Maryland area, some of whom have uh, deep relationships with the military industrial complex. Uh, I see Gene's on the call. Gene and I actually went to Dutch Rupertberger's office, uh, Rupertsberger's office for this exact thing um trying to say hey if you're saying you're an environmentalist if you're saying you support all these uh, environmental concerns then how are you sitting on the armed services uh committee and not taking action against the budget and against the carbon emissions so i know that we're uh, a little over time so i'm happy to wrap it up there uh i appreciate you guys uh offering to uh to have me speak Greg, thank you so much. I'm, I'm moved by thinking that um, one of our strategies in the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for more revival, is shifting the narrative by shifting the narrators. And I think we both, we heard some amazing testimony uh, by Phyllis and Greg. And so we have, we want to share that with one another and we want to get into breakout groups. And um, I'm going to put some questions that I'd, I'd love for all of us to discuss when we go into those breakout groups. Um, I'm still, my soul is still shaking by some of those, the, some of that data that you shared with us and, and your personal stories too, Greg. Um, so here, here are our questions. Who is our neighbor locally, globally? And what kind of neighbor is the United States of, of America? And what does this mean to you? I'm, um, I'm Jean Athey. I'm the executive director of Maryland Peace Action. And we're a partner with the Maryland Poor People's Campaign. We're delighted to consider ourselves a partner. We know that by working together, we're all much more powerful. So I wanna continue our discussion just a little bit about the global perspective of the third reconstruction, the, um, the, the, the Poor People's Cam Campaign's new important initiative. And um, as Phyllis mentioned and others have mentioned, there are two important elements of this um, global perspective, of the, the global part of it, and that is the impact of US policies abroad, especially on the poor abroad, and the effects of these same policies on us here at home. So together with the Maryland Poor People's Campaign, we formed a coalition in Maryland that's called Fund Human Needs not war. 
This is a, a broad-based and growing coalition. It's composed of diverse civil society groups, including faith-based ones. And this coalition is focused on the US war budget, which we wanna see cut. Again, working together for the same ends, we feel that we're all more powerful and we hope more successful. Because as you all know, the, the money that goes to war is desperately needed at home for all the important issues that the Poor People's Campaign has identified. And when this money is spent abroad uh, or on weapons companies, um, it's for violence, for death and destruction. We're told it's for our own security, but that is a lie. And we're usually told that, um, that it's for, that it's to assist other people. Um, and that also is a lie. As Martin Luther King said, the U.S. is the greatest purveyor of violence in the world. So we're hoping that by cutting the war budget, we can achieve two things. One is to reduce the violence inflicted on the poor abroad and also free up resources for the human needs that are so great in our own country. Now, the Biden administration budget request, which is now in Congress being considered there, increases the military part of the budget from what was already an obscene amount. It's only an increase of 1.7%. That doesn't sound like very much, but that amount is more than the entire budget of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. That is the federal organization that is tasked with addressing and preventing pandemics and all other diseases plus accidental deaths and injuries. Think about that. The Pentagon budget is so large that 1.7% of it is more than the entire budget in the US for controlling disease and accidents. So we have an action item for you to do right now. It should be in the chat. Uh, there is a link that, there it is. Thank you, Luke. Um, if you click on that link, you'll have the opportunity to immediately send an email to both of your senators and to your representative, telling them to cut at least 10% from the Pentagon budget that Congress is currently considering. Of course, we want a far larger cut, um, but we're starting with 10%. So please click on that link now and you can send three emails very easily and very quickly. Do it now or else save the link and do it when tonight's program is over. If we can let Congress know that, that we really care about this, we, we can have an effect we believe. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce the next three speakers. Um, first is Barbara Larkham. She's a longtime coordinator of Casa Baltimore Lemai, which is a friendship, friendship communities program that has for 35 years built relationships between Marylanders and Nicaragua. She works with multiple organizations and with people of diverse nationalities to foster awareness and demand justice surrounding issues of Latin America, US imperialism and world peace. A, a sociologist by training, her work has included research and also nonprofit administration. Jean, our second speaker that I'm introducing is Jean Stoken. She was taking action today with the Poor People's Campaign Women's March in DC. And so she was worried that she wouldn't be able to be here tonight. So she's recorded a special, a special message on an issue close to her heart and work. She works on the justice team with the Sisters of Mercy of the Americas where she often leads delegations to Central America and the US-Mexico border. She's bringing her experience back to her home in Maryland and to DC to deepen the call of justice and better relations with our global neighbors. And our final speaker is Tasnuva Khan. Tasnuva is a Bangladeshi American Muslim, a Marylander and a healthcare professional in Montgomery County. She's a passionate organizer for social justice through many organizations that she works with, one of which is she's chair of the Peace Action Montgomery County chapter of, of um, Maryland Peace Action, and she's co-founder of the Muslim Voices Coalition. 
Um, Tasnuva is speaking tonight to highlight urgent global issues in the Middle East and Asia and to connect them back to our local and national struggles for justice for all. So, um, Barbara, it's over to you now. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jean. Um, and good evening to everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you tonight. 42 years ago today, July 19th, 1979, the people of Nicaragua marked the official beginning of their Sandinista revolution, which had already lived for many decades, first in the heart of Augusto Cesar Sandino, and then in the hearts of all those who supported his dream. Today, we celebrate with the Nicaraguan people the continuation of their revolution. As part of that celebration, I remember today the revenge of Tomas Borje. Tomas Borje, who helped found the Sandinista National Liberation Front and helped lead the FSLN to triumph over the dictator Anastasio Somoza. During the previous years, Borje had been tortured and his wife had been killed by the Nicaraguan National Guard. Borje went on to write a poem from which I will quote a few lines. My personal revenge. My personal revenge will be the right of your children to school and to flowers. My personal revenge will be to show you, that means the National Guard, the good that there is in the eyes of my people. My personal revenge will be to say to you, good morning, without beggars in the streets. When instead of jailing you, I intend you shake the sorrow from your eyes. This is the spirit of the revolution taking place in Nicaragua. And I believe it's the kind of world that we all want to live in. You may not have heard about uh, Nicaragua's achievements over the past 14 years after the Sandinistas re-election to power in 2006. So I'm just going to share a few of these achievements with you, uh, which some of you may already be aware of. And we aspire to many of these achievements here in the United States even today. Poverty has decreased by about half and extreme poverty by more than half since 2006. Nicaragua has a high level of food security. Small farmers produce 90% of the food consumed in the country. Nicaragua is fifth in the world in gender equity according to the World Economic Forum. Their political system requires that half of all political candidates must be women. Wouldn't we like that here in the United States? The illiteracy rate is now under 5%. Public schools and universities are free for everyone through graduate school. Wouldn't we like that also? The constitution dictates that 6% of the national budget must be spent on higher education. Nearly 90% of the population have electricity now compared to only 54% in 2006. About 80% of this electricity is generated from renewable sources. Nicaragua is working hard to confront climate change through renewable energy, reforestation, and agroecology project practices. Uh, the country has a well-funded well healthcare system. The health budget has risen over 300% since 2006. The public health care system is free for everyone. Nicaragua is in the bottom 10 countries in the world in armaments and its military expenditure. Nicaraguans are not fleeing north in any great numbers compared to the Northern Triangle neighbors. Nicaragua also has the lowest homicide rate in Central America according to international organizations like the UN Development Program. There are no gangs or drug trafficking cartels in Nicaragua. These are all achievements that can be an inspiration to us here in the United States as we work for a more just and peaceful and ecologically sustainable society. No one is claiming that Nicaragua is perfect. The revolution is under construction and the people are building it as they live it. And they have the right to make mistakes and to learn from them just as we do here. But there are powerful neoliberal uh, corporate forces at work, which are trying to prevent these advances in the United States 
and they're trying to overturn the progress in Nicaragua because it is the threat of a good example to the rest of us. This year, these forces, these neoliberal forces, hope to bully the Nicaraguan people into choosing different leaders in their November elections. So we, the people, are struggling here and there against the same capitalist enemy in both places. Sadly, there's a long history of U.S. intervention in Nicaragua going back to the mid-19th century when William Walker de declared himself president. And then in the early 20th century, when the Marines invaded and ran the country until Sandino's forces finally threw them out. Then the U.S. supported three dictators in a row in Nicaragua until 1979. But let's look at more recent U.S. interventions. 35 years ago, the International Court of Justice in The Hague ruled that the United States had violated international law by supporting the Contra and mining Nicaragua's harbors in breach of our country's international obligations. This decision of the court included the need to pay reparations calculated at that time at over $17 billion. The United States refused to comply. Over 30,000 Nicaraguans died as a result of the, the war, the Contra War, and their economy was totally destroyed by the time the war ended. The United States went on to interfere in the 1990 election, pouring in millions of dollars to create a candidate of choice and to threaten the people of Nicaragua with more war if they did not vote according to U.S. dictates. Following the Sandinistas' return to power after 17 years uh, via the 2006 elections, 16 years, I guess, uh, the U.S. resumed efforts to undermine the Sandinista government, openly channeling over $200 million through Nicaragua nonprofits and dozens of newly created media outlets for regime change efforts. This culminated in a failed coup attempt that killed over 200 people in 2018. In July 2020, a USAID document leaked from the U.S. Embassy in Managua outlined an orchestrated plan called RAIN, or Responsive Assistance in Nicaragua, which was financed by the United States to launch a government transition, quote, in Nicaragua over the next two years. Right now, the Renacer Act is moving through Congress with the explicit intent <clears throat> to interfere in the Nicaraguan elections in November. The act ramps up economic sanctions, it threatens Nicaraguan voters to vote for the opposition candidate, some opposition candidate, if they do not want to suffer serious privation over coming years. It's time for the United States to stop interfering in Nicaragua and elsewhere in the world. Let's work against U.S. imperialism, and let's work to build the beautiful revolution we want here in the United States with universal health care, free education for all, an environment that sustain us, sustains us with the right of our children to school and to flowers, a world in which we shake the sorrow from our eyes. Thank you. Good evening. First, I wanna thank uh, Maryland Poor People's Campaign of which I'm a member and Peace Action for all of the work you do each and every day. Uh, I'm going to speak to the more recent history of U.S. interventionism in Honduras, but we have to name that the U.S. funded and trained counter-revolutionaries at the Contra in Honduras, who then went into Nicaragua and killed, maimed, tortured so many people, innocent people. So it's a very uh, sad role that we have, but um, we'll leave that aside and come back to the last 12 years. Uh, I also want to make a link with a domestic issue, immigration. Um, the caravans that are coming from Central America, where are most coming from? Honduras. Why? Well, the Biden administration is focused on, quote, root causes, but they name it as poverty and violence, where people are fleeing from. But we would ask, why is there poverty and violence? And how have decades of failed U.S. economic and military policies contributed to the very poverty and violence from which people are fleeing for their lives. So how a, how a problem is named matters. If it's poverty, 
uh, you throw a bunch of money down is what the administration is gearing to, rather than really looking at policies that need to change. Uh, I also think it's a teachable moment uh, for us on empire and the impact of the U.S. role abroad. The immigration provides that. There's so much anti-immigrant sentiment being fanned in mainstream media and by some politicians. So how do we use that to unmask and educate around the real causes and also help change the public narrative? Rather than blaming the victims, the immigrants, how do we look at the U.S. responsibility for for the dismantlement of their societies and why they are fleeing. So I think, if anything, we should be doing reparations for immigrants, given uh, what we have done in these countries. So uh, in 2009, June, uh, it was during the Obama administration, there was a coup. The Honduran military took the president in his pajamas out of the country, and the U.S. gave tacit support. Uh, why? Was there a coup? Well, the president wasn't a leftist, but he was starting to make changes for the poorest sectors, raising the minimum wage, giving land to small farmers, and uh, negotiating oil deals with Venezuela and other leftist governments, which all was seen as a threat to U.S. and Honduran business interests. So the coup opened the door to widespread corruption, drug cartels, the military um, was put in the place of police functions. The current president of Honduras and some of the top military and police have all been implicated in drug dealing and taking drug money. Uh, the elites have robbed money from the coffers of the public health ministry. Uh, and even after the, when the pandemic uh, outbreak started, international aid came, but it was the military who got the gloves and the masks and people who were in the streets protesting, over a thousand were arrested. Uh, they saw our Black Lives Matter in DC, you know, the street that our mayor had painted and it galvanized the social movements in Honduras. They began writing on their streets, where's the money? So we inspired that. Um, but over a hundred, way over a hundred land and water protectors have been killed since the coup. Uh, the death squads that I mentioned are now working with mining companies and, in, and uh, disappearing people. A beloved indigenous environmentalist, Berta Casades, a friend of mine, was killed over five years ago in her home. She was a beloved leader um, protesting the, the, the dam in her area, the indigenous areas. The Garifana, the Afro-Honduran uh, communities are protesting the displacement of their land because the elites want tourism because it's all along the ocean. So is our country a good neighbor? Yes, to the Honduran business elite and the government and the Honduran police and military, but those forces are killing uh, social movements there. So what to do? There's three bills in Congress uh, to stop military and police aid to Honduras, which fits in with the theme of uh, our action about cutting Pentagon spending. But another piece is just to build solidarity with poor people's movements in Honduras and elsewhere. Uh, they're vulnerable, but if international community is watching, there's a measure of protection. And by building our bonds together, uh, we can challenge the policies from a position of strength that are crushing the poor in both countries. So we can make those changes. Thank you so much. Thank you. And then we have our one final speaker, Tasnuba. Thank you for inviting me. I'm honored and humbled to be among such a distinguished panel. To be honest, I was struggling with how to tackle the topic of tonight because it's a subject that is very broad, heavy, and requires a lot of unpacking because there's so much history and nuance involved. So please bear with me as I share my perspective and tie it back to our shared movement of justice, for justice and a moral revival. As a Bangladeshi first generation American that emigrated to the US with my family at a young age, we bought into the view that the US was the most exceptional country in the world. Like many immigrants, we thought this because of the promise of freedom, access to free education, economic opportunities, and the ability to live a healthier, prosperous life than what was afforded to us back home. This was the utopian vision of life in America, as they say, the, city, the shining city upon a hill. But studying American history objectively from its origins of colonialism suggests that American exceptionalism is an ideology or view that the US must always dominate. This ideology is what led to American imperialism, military interventionism, and 
brought on these endless wars. Whether in Latin America or in the Middle East, we have been operating this way for a very long time. On 9-11, Muslim Americans, like myself, and many erroneously perceived as Muslims, were otherized and deemed suspect. Islamophobia was rampant. The US declared wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Then came military operations in conjunction with civil wars in Syria, Libya, and Yemen. Almost 20 years after we invaded Afghanistan for operating Operation Enduring Freedom, we are now leaving it back in power with the Taliban. U.S. involvement in every operation in the Middle East has been disastrous in that they have cost millions of lives and trillions of dollars. It has destabilized an entire region and has in fact fueled violent extremism rather than suppress it. We have to recognize what our objectives are to understand the implica implications of having more than 700 military bases around the world that are in 70 countries, being the world's largest arms exporter, and the Department of Defense in 2020, during the pandemic, increased contract spending to $445 billion. That was 10% increase from 2019. These defense contractors and weapons manufacturers profit, profit off of war, arms deals, and sale of military gear. The truth is, we've not only done a lot of harm to other countries with our wars, weapon sales, military, and economic sanctions, We've also done a lot of harm here by not prioritizing investment. Whether it be in education, healthcare, infrastructure, or the environment, we need to reconstruct what it means to be exceptional. That starts with defining our principles, exploring our moral compass, and being guided by it. The moral compass should guide us on our stance on the issues that we are faced with. As an individual, your moral compass, once clearly defined, should guide you to act against injustice even as little as saying that's not right. When you believe any injustice is okay, then your moral com compass will allow you to stay silent and complacent in the face of injustice, perhaps even support the perpetuation of injustice. We need to be able to have difficult conversations around issues that make us uncomfortable, which is why I built up to this point about distorted moral narrative and religious ethno-nationalism taking place here in the US and in parts of Asia and in the Middle East, because when we talk about injustice, we have to get to the point where we understand and recognize, recognize it even when it affects people or communities that are not our own or who we don't identify with. In my foreign policy advocacy work, I organize presentations on Palestinian human rights, persecution of religious minorities in India, and the government sponsored violence against Rohingya in Myanmar and their circumstances as refugees. What I've experienced is that there are always some folks who will push back in these discussions because it's uncomfortable, difficult, or complex. If your moral compass tells you to be in favor of human rights, dignity, and against oppression, then it should be all encompassing. So we have to pay attention to world matters and be aware of injustices, even if for the sake of moral revision. We need to pay attention to what's happening to advocate for vulnerable people. And so I'll list a few things, um, a few uh, things about what's happening in, in Asia and in the Middle East. The genocide against Rohingya Muslims in Myanmar has caused nearly a million Rohingya refugees who are, crowd, who are in crowded refugee camps in coastal parts of Bangladesh, where they are facing threats of climate disasters such as cyclones and flooding. There are millions of Uyghur Muslims in concentration camps in Western China with documented human rights abuses demonstrating they are forcibly being stripped of their culture, identity, and dignity. In India, under the current government, there has been a documented rise in attacks on religious minorities, Muslims, Christians, and low caste Dalits, also known as the untouchables. These are communities that are impoverished and malnourished. Under the same government, Kashmir was under lockdown for a year and a half, denied access to basic medical care and aid, cut off from the internet and other resources. And an ongoing far farmers protest in India where 250 million protesters from various farmers unions had a general strike in, in Delhi against the government for passing three new agricultural laws, which farmers believe would mostly benefit corporations and ruin their livelihoods as farmers. The U.S. has been complicit in the Saudi-led war in Yemen by supporting the Saudi regime with weapons, aircraft, and drones. The Saudi blockade in Yemen has caused a humanitarian crisis with a devastating famine. We need to call on our government to end the weapons supplies to Saudi Arabia. Just recently, 
the U.S. approved a transfer of $735 million worth of guided missiles, all taxpayer funded, to Israel after eight days of airstrikes that killed 200 Palestinians in Gaza, including 59 children. Hamas rocket fire killed 10 Israelis. The U.S. also continues to pay $3.8 billion a year to aid in Israel, military aid in Israel. Amnesty International Human Rights Watch and Israeli human rights organization Betzalem has deemed it an apartheid state that disenfranchised millions of Palestinians under a brutal occupation. I understand these may be difficult topics of discussion for some, but if we want to be exceptional in fighting social, moral, and economic justice, we need to follow our moral compass. When fighting the pandemic or stopping climate change, global problems need to be solved with a global approach that requires diplomacy, cooperation, and interdependence with peaceful solutions. Just as the world needs this cooperation to save lives and save our planet, as activists and organizers building a movement, we need to work as co-collaborators and be interdependent of one another. Our shared movement for justice, human rights, climate action, the fight to end poverty, to end systemic racism are all aligned. And as activists and grassroots organizers, we know that in order to make gains in our communities, we need to empower our community members and enlist them to take part so we can all reach our collective goals. We are all inheriting a world of injustice and crises. So it's imperative that we work together, find common ground, and continue to build this movement for civil rights, human rights, economic and environmental justice, and peace. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. My heart's on fire. I don't know if anyone else's heart is on fire. Um, I think now would be a really great time to put that fire into a song that we can all sing with one another. Barbara and I were in a breakout group and we talked about how in many ways we're all neighbors and and just and pulling out who our neighbors are. So neighbor, neighbor, can't you see that healthcare is what we need? Oh, 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 this war economy has got to go. So that's, it's going to be a call and response. Um, and feel free to put it in the chat things that that uh, you would like that we need, that, that we, the poor and dispossessed of this world globally need, whether it's housing, whether it's healthcare, and we're gonna sing about that together. Um, and one day we will all sing in one room together, but it kind of goes like this. Neighbor, neighbor, can't you see? Why housing is what we need. Neighbor, neighbor, can't you see? Why housing is what we need. Oh, 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 oh. this war economy's got to go. Oh, 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 oh. this war economy's got to go. So let's use that chat. What else do we need? And this is a great song when you're marching. It's actually a military cadence that we are actually taking back because it keeps all of us in step because that's what we need. Housing, let's do healthcare. Here we go. Neighbor, neighbor, can't you see? Why health? Why? Sorry, it's been a long day. We are in DC earlier. Healthcare, healthcare is what we need. Neighbor, neighbor, can't you see? Why healthcare is what we need. Oh, 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 oh. The war economy's got to go. Oh, oh, oh. The war economy's got to go. Neighbor, neighbor, can't you see? Why voting rights are what we need. Neighbor, neighbor, can't you see? Why voting rights are what we need. Oh, this war economy's got to go. Oh, oh, oh. this war economy's got to go. Neighbor, neighbor, can't you see? Clean air and water is what we need. Neighbor, neighbor, can't you see? Clean air and water's what we need. Go. 
to go. Thank you all so much for being here with us. As we say, I think we can come off mute for some of this forward together. Not one, Not step, one step back. back. One step, step back. back. Forward together. Not, Not one, one step, step back. back. One more step. Forward together. Not, Not one step back. back. That's right. Thank you, peace action. action. <laughs> Thank you so much to all of our speakers, and we look forward to building. Thank you, everyone. You in this in this international solidarity. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night. Thank you. Good night, all. Thank Good you. Night. Good night, everyone. Good night.